We welcome to the session uh, on health and disaster risk reduction. Uh, we highly appreciate uh, you coming to, uh, to this session. Uh, I will just give uh, uh, introductory remarks on behalf of UNISDR, and then I will introduce my uh, two co-chairs who will uh, lead and facilitate the, the, the sessions. Uh, can we have the first presentation, please? Yeah. So just a, a quick uh, overview of the health in the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. Um, I don't know where to... So, as you know, the, the Sendai framework was adopted in March 2015 with the expected outcome is to reduce uh, the disaster risk and losses in lives, livelihood, and health, and also in economic, physical, social, cultural, and environmental assets of the people, the businesses, the communities, and the countries. Um, in, in the uh, Sendai framework, uh, there are specific actions were requested uh, by uh, states because states were identified as the primary uh, responsibility uh, for uh, implementation of the Sendai framework. And the, this list of uh, actions uh, summarizes what's in, in, in the framework. So uh, countries have to appoint uh, national focal points uh, in, in, uh, in the terms of institutions. Uh, they need to update the risk information, including for biological and man-made hazards. They need to identify baseline and set targets so they can monitor the progress and report on it. They need to update uh, the DRR strategies and the plan to align with the new uh, Sendai framework. And uh, uh, they need also to review their legislations uh, and uh, laws and regulations uh, to align also with the Sendai framework. And to do this, we need to promote and strengthen our local and national disaster risk reduction platforms. And of course, all this work has to be in coherence uh, with the other uh, important international uh, uh, policy frameworks like the, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Climate Change Adaptations. So uh, during the discussions for the Sendai framework uh, and uh, recognizing uh, by member states and agencies uh, the importance and the huge uh, toll uh, in terms of human impacts and also the economic impacts of health emergencies and health uh, threats, uh, health was included as a, a key component of the Sendai framework under the scope. So now it's uh, Sendai framework goes beyond the natural hazard to include biological uh, hazard uh, and also technological hazards. Um, in the Sendai framework, the main focus uh, for health is on uh, strengthening and building resilient health system uh, so it can withstand all type of hazards. And uh, to do this, you have to integrate disaster risk reduction into health sector at all level, but you, we also need to mainstream uh, uh, health uh, into disaster risk reduction. And we need to uh, develop the capacity of our healthcare worker to understand the disaster risk and to uh, apply and implement risk reduction measures in the health sector. Um, after this, the adoption, uh, we had another milestone, uh, which is the international uh, conference uh, on the implementation of the health aspect of the Sendai framework that was held in Bangkok in uh, March 2016, uh, hosted by the government of Thailand and co-organized with Thailand and WHO. Uh, we discussed there the current status of the implementation and the gap of the integration of health into disaster risk reduction and we came up with a recommendations on how to implement uh, this health aspect in a comprehensive, multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary uh, way. And we called the outcome the Bangkok principles. 
these seven principles, they mainly talk about the integration, they talk about enhanced collaboration between the health sector and other relevant sectors uh, to, to implement the Sendai framework, but also to implement the international health regulations and to build a resilient health system. We talked about investment from the public and the private sector in risk reduction in health. We talked about uh, the importance of including disaster risk reduction in the health uh, uh, curriculum uh, for education, uh, higher education, and also for training courses on the job. And, of course, we talked about the importance of the data, to get the data from the health sector and include it into disaster loss databases and risk profiling and risk assessment. And finally, uh, of course, all this should be done in cross-sectoral, cross-border uh, uh, collaboration uh, uh, approach. And finally, we talked about the coherence with the SDGs and the climate change agenda and also the urban agendas. So now we are here in this global platform, in this working sessions, to, to talk about uh, the progress since the Bangkok uh, conference last year and to identify ways on how to commit and work together to advance these opportunities and to advance uh, the disaster risk reduction health, uh, in health sectors. So with this, I, I now introduce uh, my... Um, uh, the co-chairs, uh, Dr. Subumit from the Ministry of Public Health in Thailand, and Ms. Aida Laruda, the president of uh, Tulosa Federation of Senior Citizen or Organization in the Philippines. Dr. Subumit, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wanas. Uh, good morning, distinguished guests. I join Dr. Wanas in welcoming you uh, to this uh, working session. Uh, it is essentially an opportunity to expand on the discussion that have been made in the earlier session, uh, which has excellently uh, revisited uh, the uh, Sendai framework. Uh, we will explore more into the health security issue of the Sendai framework. As Dr. Wanas has already uh, pointed out, that uh, health is an important aspect of the Sendai framework. And in this regard, uh, the emphasis is placed on building resilient health systems at all operational levels. I would like to uh, highlight a little bit on the biological hazards that, that are targeted under uh, this aspect of the Sendai framework. Uh, the biological hazards uh, include, in particular, the zoonotic and vector-borne diseases that have potentials uh, for epidemic and pandemics. And the recent outbreaks of uh, Ebola in uh, West Africa, uh, MERS in the Middle East, and Zika virus infection in the Americas have clearly demonstrated the potentials for devastating health, social, and economic impacts. Also, the climate and environmental changes have significant influences on the emergence of spread and the spread of the infectious diseases and on the physical and mental health of the people in general, as well as on poverty, education, and economy in broader scale and in longer term. And as Dr. Wanas uh, just mentioned, uh, last year, a meeting was held in Bangkok, Thailand, to expand on the health aspect of Sendai framework. And we came up with the so-called Bangkok principles, which recommend measures that countries may take to implement the health aspects of the Sendai framework. Uh, this working session will make certain reference to the Bangkok principles to review on the efforts made and the experiences developed in many countries to get health systems better oriented to disaster risk management. Now I would like to turn to uh, our co-chair, uh, Ms. Aida Laruda, to give additional introductory remark. 
Thank you, Doctor. And good morning, everyone. Our distinguished panel of resource speakers and discussants, our delegates from all over the world, participants to this session, and officials of the United Nations, a pleasant day to all. Yes, we are now on our fifth day of this fifth global platform for disaster risk reduction. And I am privileged and honored to welcome you to this session on health and disaster risk reduction. I am Aida Zabala Laruda, a senior citizen, president of the senior citizens' organizations, a civil society organization in Leyte, Philippines. And speaking of the Philippines, it may be recalled that in November 2013, the world's fiercest typhoon hit my country. Super Typhoon Haiyan wrought havoc and vast destruction to infrastructure, agriculture, homes, and livelihood, and practically everything around the stricken areas of Haiyan in Leyte and in the other provinces. Haiyan took its toll on the population on a significant percentage of one of the vulnerable groups, the elderly or older persons to which I belong. For varied reasons, among which was health. The number of lost lives claimed by Haiyan rose to unprecedented proportion, never before experienced by the Philippines in peace times. It was so unfortunate, so sad, that such disaster had to happen. It should not happen again, not in the Philippines, nor anywhere else, if we are prepared, or better yet, if we are better prepared. This morning, the session is meant to provide a platform for member states and key actors in health and health and disaster risk reduction and management towards identifying ways and committing to work together to collaborate to meaningfully achieve the global targets of the Sandai framework. This session then aims to achieve the following objectives. One, share progress, challenges, and lessons learned in applying the health aspects of Sunday framework and the Bangkok principles for implementation. In focus would be the Americas, Europe, and West Africa. Second, to present innovative initiatives to drive the implementation of the health aspects of the Sendai framework and the Bangkok principles, particularly at national and local levels, and how this contributes to and in coherence with other relevant international policy frameworks, such as the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and the international health regulations. And three, to elaborate how the integration of health and disaster risk reduction contributes to the achievement of the Sendai Framework Global Targets, particularly Target E, on increasing the number of countries with national and local disaster reduction risk reduction plans by 2020, as well as other targets. So now, without much ado, we proceed with the panel dis discussion. The panel of speakers to be introduced by my co-chair, Dr. Summit, and their interventions. Thank you, Ms. Ruda. Uh, let me join you in the Club for Senior Citizens to work for the people not so senior for the health of the people of all generations. Um, now we have about an hour left. <laughs> yeah, we, we, the time is uh, very limited. Uh, distinguished guests, we have five invited speakers who will share with us 
their valuable experiences and views. As input for our learning and discussions, I am honored to introduce and welcome the following speakers. First, Dr. Alex Camacho from the, region, uh, the Regional Advisor of Emergency Preparedness and Disaster Risk Reduction of the Pan-American Health Organization. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. For me, it's uh, an honor to be sharing this panel with so distinguished uh, panelists. First of all, I'd like to send their highest, warmest regards from Dr. Ciro Ugarte, the Director of Health Emergencies Department at the Pan-American Health Organization. Uh, for reasons of time, I'll switch to Spanish, if you allow me. Okay, you may. So I can make it in five minutes. En estos eh, minutos hablaré puntualmente sobre las acciones que los Ministerios de Salud de las Américas están desarrollando para implementar el marco de Sendai en, en salud. Siguiente, por favor. Next, please. Como saben, las Américas es la segunda región más afectada por desastres. Solamente en el año 2016... Eh, en el terremoto de Ecuador, 676 personas murieron y más de 3 millones de dólares se dieron en pérdidas. Y el huracán Matthew con una pérdida sustancial de más de 500 vidas de igual forma. En una información recolectada con los ministerios de salud, sabemos en dónde estamos en las Américas. Más del 45% de los ministerios de salud cuentan con una oficina para la coordinación de emergencias y desastres. Este es uno de los puntos importantes para la, el manejo, eh, para, la, para la gestión del riesgo de desastres. En cuanto a los centros operativos de emergencia, más del 60% de los ministerios de salud cuentan con un centro operativo de operaciones de emergencia. En lo referente a planes de emergencia, planes nacionales de respuesta, 45% lo han finalizado y los demás están en progreso o no los han finalizado aún. Eh, pero un punto importante para señalar en cuanto a los planes de emergencia es que solamente el 26% de estos planes han sido aprobados hace menos de un año atrás. Los demás están en proceso o de actualización o de prueba justamente en estos, en estos planes. La última evaluación del riesgo eh, de, con un enfoque multi amenazas eh, realizada en los últimos dos años, corresponde también al 45%, es decir, 14 países de los 35 de las Américas. En un proceso participativo que empezó en octubre del 2015, los ministerios de salud decidieron elaborar un plan de acción alineado al marco de Sendai, que además tiene coherencia con los principios de Bangkok que se han mencionado. Las cuatro líneas de acción coherentes con el marco de Sendai, que hace relación, la primera, a reconocer a entender el riesgo de desastres en el sector salud, para analizar el riesgo. Y los países han ido más allá, han definido ya acciones específicas que están realizando o se encuentran en desarrollo, como el mapeo de amenazas, el mapeo de vulnerabilidad y que de capacidades, con un enfoque multi amenazas, no solamente el tema de desastres, sino también el riesgo a epidemias u otros aspectos. Estos eh, puntos que he señalado son algunas eh, recomendaciones o aspectos claves identificados de una reunión regional realizada este pasado 23 de mayo aquí en México. Y fuera de los aspectos relacionados, además de los aspectos relacionados a la necesidad de un enfoque multiamenaza, a el uso de nuevas tecnologías para, para identificar y, y eh, para identificar y mapear riesgos, amenazas y otras, es una gran importancia que se ha dado a la discusión sobre que esos aspectos de evaluación del riesgo tengan una especial consideración en zonas de frontera, particularmente por los aspectos relacionados también a migración. La línea 2 de este plan de acción hace referencia a la necesidad de fortalecer la gobernanza, fortalecer las estructuras organizacionales dentro de los ministerios de salud, al contar con tiempo eh, personal a tiempo completo, profesionales certificados, pero fundamentalmente dos actividades que se han priorizado es el desarrollo y el mejoramiento de los centros nacionales, los centros de operaciones de emergencia, centros que funcionen tanto para el monitoreo de las acciones, de las emergencias en situaciones de fenómenos naturales como de epidemias. Es decir, un sola una sola fuerza de salud 
un solo centro de operaciones y un solo centro, un solo comité nacional de emergencias y de desastres, como mecanismos para fortalecer. Y entonces se identifica la importancia de que los mecanismos de coordinación intersectorial son importantes y relevantes para la respuesta. Es necesario fortalecer la inclusión, pero principalmente no solamente trabajar en el nivel nacional, sino aterrizar al nivel local y trabajar con la comunidad para fortalecer estos mecanismos de coordinación. En estos slides que ustedes pueden ver, son las conclusiones de la relatoría de la reunión del 23 de mayo. En el punto 3, relacionado a la, a la inversión que habla el marco de Sendai, nosotros lo hemos aterrizado en lo que es una iniciativa que lleva algunos años en ejecución, el tema de hospitales seguros y hospitales resilientes, la iniciativa de Smart Hospitals, combinar a los aspectos de seguridad hospitalaria, la adaptación y mitigación al cambio climático, aplicando el índice de seguridad hospitalaria, pero sobre todo gestionando aquellas acciones críticas que deben realizarse. Y dentro de esto, un punto crítico, identificado por los ministerios de salud, es la necesidad de apropiación de los beneficiarios, de los gestores, de los trabajadores de salud sobre sus beneficios, de, sobre esta inversión, la necesidad de generar evidencia de lo que se va desarrollando, es decir, poder tener ya datos de costo-beneficio de las intervenciones, pero además de que los datos de hospital seguro se utilicen para la acreditación en los países según las normas nacionales. La cuarta línea de acción va en coherencia al desarrollo de las capacidades para la preparación, la respuesta y la recuperación en el sector salud, particularmente al tener planes y procedimientos probados, pero se han identificado ciertas acciones que van en relación a contar con planes nacionales de respuesta que estén actualizados, aprobados y probados. El desarrollo y el fortalecimiento de los equipos multidisciplinarios de respuesta en salud eh, apoyar también la iniciativa de equipos médicos de emergencia y una gran brecha identificada de la necesidad de trabajar en planes de recuperación. Entonces, se identificó la importancia de una respuesta multisectorial coordinada, el manejo de las epidemias y de los aspectos y de la, de la supervisión de la vigilancia epidemiológica que esté en armonía a la respuesta también en los desastres, eh, garantizar los stocks eh, estratégicos sectorialmente identificados, pero además integrar los, eh, a los sistemas médicos de emergencia las respuestas tanto en fenómenos naturales como a epidemias. La necesidad de trabajar sobre legislación específica que soporte la preparación, la respuesta y la recuperación, particularmente en donde eh, vayamos a reconstruir mejor a la hora de, de utilizar los estándares de hospitales seguros, por ejemplo, y por supuesto también entender las diferentes alertas tanto del sector salud como de los, de los mecanismos nacionales de respuesta. Se ha hecho mucho énfasis también acá en los aspectos relacionados a la movilidad humana y a la migración como parte de la respuesta de igual forma. Y en general las consideraciones ya en el proceso de implementación, es decir, no hemos venido a contarles lo que deseamos hacer, sino lo que los países están desarrollando, los avances que ellos están teniendo, es tener una adecuada, fortalecer los mecanismos de coordinación entre las autoridades nacionales de riesgo o de protección civil con salud y trabajar con un solo enfoque a la hora de entender el enfoque multiamenaza, su preparación, su respuesta y su eh, recuperación. La necesidad de que las oficinas, la institucionalización de la gestión del riesgo de desastres en los ministerios de salud tenga un aspecto adecuado y jerárquicamente ubicado para que las decisiones se tomen al más alto nivel, eh, con un solo enfoque, si bien sea para epidemias o bien sea para fenómenos naturales o de otro tipo, y cada vez más a trabajar y aterrizar las acciones en salud hacia la red integrada de servicios de salud como actores principales y componentes del día a día para continuar operando durante y después de los desastres. Quiero terminar enfatizando que este breve comentario que hemos realizado al plan de acción es un proceso en donde participan los 35 estados miembros y los territorios de las Américas. Es un plan construido por los países, para los países apropiado por ellos y que sin duda alguna eh, está siendo un ejemplo para el mundo. Gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Camacho, for sharing your vast experiences uh, on Pahu Plan of Action for Disaster Risk Reduction in America, even in the very limited time. 
Um, uh, for the interest of time, each speaker is asked uh, to make the presentation in about five minutes. Uh, I know this is very challenging, but <laughs> I'm certain uh, uh, we will make it. And uh, I suggest that we hold questions and comments until all the speakers have uh, finished the presentation. Uh, now I would like to call upon the second speaker, uh, Dr. Mas Massimo Ciotti from the European Center for Disease Control, or ECDC, who will share with us the thoughts on strengthening the capacity of healthcare workers for disaster preparedness. Uh, Dr. Ciotti, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been uh, asked to uh, give a little bit of an overview of what uh, uh, the European uh, Union is doing on uh, in the area of implementation of the Sendai Framework uh, for Action, and mainly on, on some activities that are related to the biological hazards. ECDC is uh, an agency of Europe, uh, the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, uh, which mandate, whose mandate is uh, on uh, uh, communicable diseases. We have asked uh, last year, actually, uh, our countries, uh, what do they need uh, in terms of um, um, uh, activities uh, uh, from uh, ECDC, what kind of support uh, for implementing the uh, European policy on um, uh, cross-border health threats that uh, links with the IHR and uh, also horizontally links with the um, Sendai framework. Now, this was a, a review what uh, we received last year, and we, uh, we had to plan on one, some type of uh, implementation of the activities. And you can see that uh, some of these are prioritized. And uh, we have been uh, then accelerating uh, development of activities together with the countries. Uh, the countries in Europe have the responsibility to implement uh, whatever is related to the health sector, but we support technically uh, when it is uh, about multi-country aspects. We have developed a plan uh, on uh, three axes, uh, on, uh, on identification evidence and dissemination of good practice and on capacity strengthening, and these are to uh, reach three, uh, four goals. So the, the first you see is a decision 1082 actually is a, is a European uh, um, legislation that covers all aspects of uh, health threats uh, cro with cross-border and cross-sectorial relevance. And there's a link to the, the various aspects of the Sendai framework. Um, the other goals are to support the countries and then they, to, to, to uh, promote intersectorial collaboration and, uh, and activities within uh, ACDC that are coordinated across uh, different functions. Um, what we do in supporting the, the, the public health emergency preparedness, and this is actually what is uh, my role there, is uh, uh, firstly we uh, try to uh, look at the uh, first aspect of the cycle. The preparedness, as you know, public health emergency preparedness is a, a continuous quality improvement cycle uh, from anticipation through response and recovery, but all uh, uh, steps uh, need to be um, uh, considered. Uh, on, uh, on the first aspect, so how, how we uh, 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 assess the risk or we, we uh, rank the risks, uh, the national plans uh, normally are multi-hazard, um, but uh, not, there are some hazards that are more important than others, so we need to uh, also understand how they need to be uh, ranked or, or prioritized. Uh, we have developed a, a number of tools and we work with the countries uh, where we do a, what we call a, a rapid risk assessment. It is different from the other type of risk assessment. Uh, it's mainly based on, uh, on um, uh, um, information that uh, at the very early stages of an outbreak is not confirmed. So it's a, a, a continuous uh, uh, refinement of the of signals and, uh, and information. Uh, we have also developed a, a, a risk ranking uh, tool that is now being used uh, to uh, uh, prioritize plans in uh, countries. And the criteria are being developed through a multi uh, uh, sectoral consultation that lasted for more than two years. We have now, we have now published this uh, uh, last week, I think. Um, we are also working across uh, different aspects on, on preparedness. As we, uh, for example, we did um, uh, preparedness plans for uh, um, uh, mosquito-borne diseases, actually, that uh, have been uh, 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 quite expanding also in Europe 
because of uh, some climate change and uh, because of the risk of, of uh, Zika, but also other vector borne like the, uh, chikungunya or dengue uh, countries were very much uh, uh, concerned about. We also have uh, worked across the, uh, the uh, um, continuous crisis of um, uh, migration within Europe, uh, trying to assist the countries, those that are mo most uh, affected in the, in the front line, to in, in, uh, reinforce their preparedness capacities in uh, public health. And uh, we have initiated also a work uh, uh, to, to see how the institutions and the communities collaborate in preparedness. Uh, we have also developed uh, a, a, a training and exercising uh, to support all these aspects. And uh, most of these were developed during the Ebola, after the Ebola. Uh, we are now uh, uh, developing also core competencies for public health emergency preparedness that actually based on, uh, on uh, 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 some aspects that we have already developed uh, together with uh, uh, other partners. Uh, mainly, we, we have uh, worked on a logic uh, framework. We distinguish be between capacities and uh, capabilities, where capacities are the things, resources, the capabilities are the abilities to implement them and to, to work across the, the set. So these are system type of uh, um, aspects. And uh, uh, based on this framework that we developed together with the Harvard School of Public Health and uh, Georgetown University, we have uh, now initiated a, a work on developing uh, um, competence-based uh, um, models and, and, and manual. And the competencies for public health emergency preparedness are, 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 are uh, combinations of knowledge and skills that uh, need to be measurable, uh, need to be uh, specific to the jobs, and uh, it can be uh, provided in, in modular format. Uh, we have initiated this work now, and uh, I hope that by end of the year we will have the, the competency-based handbook uh, ready that will be used by the countries. Uh, in uh, the last phase is actually the evaluation is where we sometimes uh, often lack uh, capacity to learn from lessons. Uh, what we have also done is, uh, is the developing uh, a, a number of uh, case studies. Uh, that means actually country reviews. Uh, we do this in peer reviews, uh, uh, experts from other countries visiting uh, uh, other ca countries that had similar issues. We are now developing two, two um, uh, handbooks one on, uh, on um, a, a self-assessment tool and on a critical incident review uh, that can be called in different ways, a critical incident or after event reviews. And uh, all these are done through uh, uh, large consultations with experts in the countries. Uh, these are uh, um, modules that are now being developed and going to be uh, tested and piloted in the countries uh, to assess and evaluate how the system works. Uh, we have also done uh, uh, case studies, for example, for the Ebola, but uh, that's a, we enlarged it to uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers uh, with five modules approach, uh, where the, uh, the most aspects uh, were related to the, the, the risk of introduction of, uh, of um, uh, Ebola, but also other viral hemorrhagic fevers uh, recently. Um, now, this year, we are implementing a number of activities. I cannot go through, it, through them, but you can see that we are also working on, on bio-risk, and uh, that's, uh, the, the bio-risk is, uh, is something that uh, is very important for the public health sector, but also we're working together with uh, law enforcement and civil protection uh, on, um, on parts and property equipment of frontline workers. Uh, we will do a large multi-country simulation exercises on One Health uh, later in November and December. And, um, and then we are now accelerating the development of all the guidances and, um, and tools that will be used by the countries. Uh, so that is more or less what uh, we're doing. And finally, uh, we initiated already uh, the, a, a work uh, to understand how the normally preparedness is in institutional activities, is, is implemented by institutions. Responses that uh, measures are implemented by or sometimes posed to communities by uh, the institutions. Uh, we want to understand how the communities uh, uh, can be uh, integrated into this process. We have uh, in, uh, uh, already concluded a phase one, a historical consideration of the, of the work, and now we are uh, doing some empirical, empirical data gathering through case studies in the countries, and uh, we would like to develop a guidance uh, next year on uh, how uh, the, the work between the, the two um, uh, areas, the communities, and institutions can be improved. Uh, so that is uh, con my conclusion. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Chonti.
for the impressive uh, work of the European CDC in providing technical support to member countries uh, that are facing challenges, especially at this time. A lot of uh, migrant uh, movements uh, in several countries. Uh, I think we should uh, move on. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. William Koresh, the Executive Vice President of the Health and Policy of EcoHealth Alliance, and also the President of the OIE Working Group on Wildlife and many other important positions. Uh, Dr. Koresh will be sharing with, uh, with us uh, the best practices of adopting the One Health approach to reduce risk of pandemics and other emergencies and its integration of the value and the value of the national disaster risk reduction strategies. Uh, Dr. Koresh, please. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and good morning, good afternoon to the delegates. It's an honor to be here. I wanted to talk with you today about a little about the underlying science and what we know about uh, disease outbreaks um, and some of the, the things we can do to reduce the risk. So it's kind of framed in this concept of One Health about the connection between the health of the environment and the health of people and the health of animals. Um, and the other reason is because of disease outbreaks and pandemics is really a whole, requires a whole society approach. It's not very, it's not under the authority of the medical community. It's the, what drives that, and I think you'll see in some of my slides, is what drives these disease outbreaks and pandemics um, come from other sectors. So we really need a, a kind of a unified approach. Now I'm going to kind of talk mostly about infectious diseases uh, because we share a lot of our infectious diseases. It's a good example of this One Health concept. Uh, the majority of infectious diseases in humans are shared with animals. Many are linked back to animals. And when we look at a global scale, it's about one billion people every year. So there's our baseline without big outbreaks, without disasters, there's this under, ongoing baseline of these, zoo, we call them zoonotic infectious diseases, one, diseases shared between animals and people. Um, if you look back over the last 50 or 60 years, we see that the number of these emerging disease events, which are these new diseases, or an old disease in a new place, they're increasing every decade. And we're up to about two or three now every year. Um, and most of those are linked back to animals. A lot of them are linked to wildlife, and hence that environmental connection. Um, they have a tremendous impact, and Dr. Juan Alsa uh, uh, earlier kind of showed this slide, but we're talking about tens of billions of dollars in economic impact, and that's not because of the medical problem. Those are effects on trade, on travel, on tourism. So these have are huge disasters economically, even if they have a very small impact on the health of individuals. You might have very few individuals that are medically infected, but you have these spill-on effects, which are really huge. And this kind of illustrates it with SARS. If you see the up at the top there, that second box near the top, that's the actual medical cost of SARS. Um, but the other cost of SARS economically, 30 to $50 billion US, were unrelated to the healthcare. Uh, so this is, once again, a whole of society thing. If you look at the history of emerging infectious diseases or these outbreaks, um, you see this pattern. But this has nothing to do with risk. This is very biased by reporting. So countries or people or academic institutions that report, you get this projection. But when you look at the underlying drivers of what causes risk of a disease, a new zoonotic emerging disease, the pattern looks very different. When you remove that reporting bias, we start to see a pattern like this. So certain places on the planet are at higher risk of disease outbreaks than other places, just like earthquakes, other disasters like typhoons, certain places are higher risk than other places. And so it becomes predictable, which means we can actually invest in prevention to reduce risk and preparedness to reduce the impact. 
What are those drivers? The largest driver is land use change. What we're, how we change the use of land, deforestation, reforestation, conversion to pastures, conversion to agricultural systems. Those are the big drivers of disease emergence. So we know where that's taking place geographically, and we know which activities actually are higher risk for outbreaks and pandemics. So once again, we have an opportunity for risk reduction, prevention, and preparedness. Um, and it's really, a, as I mentioned, a whole of society. And these drivers are increasing now. At a country level, for all of you that are delegates from countries, those combination of drivers are different. So you can do in a risk evaluation at your country level to know what, which of those factors are driving risk of disease outbreaks, emergence, pen, which can lead to pen, global pandemics, and you can work on that. So Ebola is a great example. We know what factors lie behind, behind uh, the disease emergence, and rather than waiting until an outbreak and just waiting and being prepared to respond, we can actually do some things to prevent it. So there's certain human behaviors, certain activities linked with deforestation, encroachment in the forest, consumption of wildlife, whereas we can educate the private sector and individuals and civil society of how they can avoid getting these diseases and reduce their risk. We can't avoid every outbreak, but we can reduce the numbers. So this kind of demonstrates this reactive versus a prevention approach. Typically, we do respond, and the better we respond, the better we are. But if you compare Ebola outbreaks in the Democratic Republic of the Congo happening at the same time as the West African outbreaks, in the Congo, there was a higher level of preparedness. There was more community education. There was a re reduction in risk. And the impact in the Congo was much lower than it was in West Africa, where they were a little s slower to respond, but also didn't have community education. Now, diseases don't have to arise in your country. They can also arrive in your country. So we can use these same techniques to look at which airports with global trade and travel are at higher risk of receiving a disease from another country than others. Once again, it's an opportunity to put in place prevention and risk reduction. So I think my message to you today is um, we have the responsibility to act, to reduce risk. We don't have to wait until these disease outbreaks. The best method of approach is really prevention on these. Same with weather, and this is my last slide. Um, we know that weather patterns affect disease, and not just infectious diseases, but even nutritional diseases, famines as disaster. These are also predictable. Um, we know about weather patterns. This is the Southern Oscillation, the El Nino, La Nina effect, and it has a global impact on different types of diseases and different types of um, agricultural systems. So once again, they, they, as this event unfolds, we know where in the world those problems are, are, we can reduce risk, we can be better prepared. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Koresh. Dr. Koresh has uh, clearly pointed out that the understanding of one health concept is so important as this concept is so fundamental uh, for the essential, comprehensive, and balanced uh, management of any health uh, problems, especially health emergencies, uh, for which multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral cooperation are so important. Uh, I think we should move on to the next speaker. Uh, I would like to welcome Ms. Cristina Romanelli, the coordinator of the Joint Work Program on the Biodiversity and Health of the UN Biodiversity Convention and of the World Health Organization. Uh, Ms. Um, Romanelli, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Co-Chair. And, and um, I really would like to take just a moment to thank the, the organizers for the opportunity to address you all in this room and to sit amongst a truly distinguished panel of speakers. It really is a very humbling experience. So thank you for that. Um, and surprisingly, um, I was told, and it, it appears uh, apparent from, from some of the other sessions that I had uh, the pleasure to attend, that the UN Biodiversity Convention is not something that all of you are aware of. So maybe I will begin with a very quick uh, introduction. So the Biodiversity Convention is one of the three Rio conventions um, that arose and was born out of the 1992 Earth Summit. So each of the three instruments that arose from the summit, which are biodiversity, climate change, and desertification, represent a way of contributing to the sustainable development of objectives of Agenda 21 and others that follow, uh, including most recently the Sustainable Development Goals. So the three conventions are intrinsically linked, operating in the same ecosystems and addressing interde interdependent issues such as those that we're addressing here. Social outcomes, including health and economic development, are intimately related and um, with health of our e ecosystems, and they share multiple causal interdependencies and risks, but also shared opportunities to attenuate, mitigate, and minimize those risks, which is at the heart of the three key messages that I would like to uh, convey here, and which I will try to keep um, brief in the interest of time. These will respectively address risk, resilience, and ways forward ways forward that are complementary to those that have already been put forward, of course. So in the first instant, instance, I think it bears reminding that disasters can be precipitated by impacts on critical ecosystems or the collapse of a host of ecosystem services that are essential to our health, including as sources of food, essential nutrients, medicines, medicinal compounds, fuel, energy, um, uh, sources of livelihoods. Importantly, they also contribute to the provision of clean air and water, perform critical functions that range from the regulation of pests and disease to the regulation of climate and natural disasters which is why we're all here. So each of these functions has both direct and indirect consequences for our health and well-being in times of risks. And each of them is an important component of the complex epidemiological puzzle that Dr. Koresh just presented to us and with which we're confronted uh, to stem the tides of both infectious and non communicable diseases. So we all know, of course, that disasters include flooding, storm, extreme weather, wildfires, as well as biological hazards and disease epidemics. But we also need to bear in mind that some of these outcomes can, in fact, be precipitated by ecosystem disrupt disruption while also increasing the frequency and intensity of some climate-related extreme events and disasters. So with this in mind, one of my key messages is that a key consideration that I do want you to bear in mind is that ecosystem degradation can and does often increase the vulnerability of human populations to these disasters while compounding the effects of other drivers, including climate change which has been, yes, addressed in some of these health sessions in particular, but is not notably present in many of the sessions that, are, um, that, that have been held. Yet, 
The impacts of climate and disasters really do need to be addressed in tandem because over 80% of these drivers actually intersect. Just taking a few examples, the number of reported weather-related natural disasters has more than tripled since the 1960s, resulting in over 60,000 deaths each year, mainly in developing countries. Rising sea levels and increasing extreme weather events will continue to destroy homes, medical facilities, and other essential services. Lack of fresh, safe water, can result from, which can result from changing rainfall patterns, can compromise hygiene, incre increase the risk of diarrheal disease, which kills almost 600,000 children aged under five each, each year. And the list goes on and on. This brings me to the second related point. So on the flip side of risk, biodiversity and ecosystem conservation, restoration and sustainable use can itself strengthen the resilience of ecosystems, both by contributing to adaptation to climate change and moderating the impact of disasters on human populations and, national, and natural environments. So, the point to be made is that disaster resilient societies are increasingly linked to and dependent upon resilience in ecosystems and sustainability and security in the flow and delivery of essential ecosystem services. So, not only those directly affected with resilience to um, immediate disaster impacts, but also those that normally support communities, including vulnerable populations, um, as well as, of course, society at large. So maybe one thing to consider is that long-term health status is an important indicator of resilience, of the resilience of a community. And um, a marker for capacity to overcome or adapt to health challenges and other social, environmental, and economic pressures. So, in the interest of time, I may not have the opportunity to go through the full range of examples um, and ways forward. But I do want to examine one additional opportunity um, that, that we haven't so far addressed, an entry point, which are ecosystem-based adaptation and eco-disaster risk reduction. So ecosystem-based approaches to adaptation and disaster risk, which are both relatively new holistic approaches that are, that are derived from broader adaptation and disaster risk practices and both are in the process of developing uh, assessment, monitoring, and evaluation methodologies. In many cases, eco-DRR activities are the same as ecosystem-based adaptation, which you may be more familiar with, um, but are um, specifically implemented to reduce risk. So, Ecosystem-based adaptation can sometimes be considered an example of eco-DRR and vice versa. A recent review of the commonalities and differences between both found that in practice, it is difficult to distinguish between the two, but both do need to be considered in tandem. And I think part of the added value and also commonalities between both of these approaches include an emphasis that, that are heavily reliant actually on ecosystem-based approach is that they encourage the participation of the local and they involve assessment and vulnerabilities of risk. So one dimension that we really do need to consider in each of our disaster risk reduction and mitigation strategies 
is the participation of the local, including indigenous peoples and local communities, which is often promoted, incidentally, as a guiding principle of ecosystem-based adaptation and disaster risk implementation. And maybe if I were to make one final point, is that such strategies, integrative approaches such as these, such as One Health, such as ecosystem-based adaptation and um, disaster risk reduction strategies, are not only important, but essential to building the resilience of natural and managed landscapes. They're essential to jointly reducing the vulnerabilities of ecosystems and communities that rely upon them for their health and well-being. And they also generate more cost-effective strategies with benefits beyond resilience, some of which Dr. Koresh has alluded to before, such as protecting marine food chains, supporting local fisheries, small-scale agriculture, livelihoods, etc. So I think with that, I will close. Thank you very much, Ms. Romanelli, for your sharing uh, of a very important message on biodiversity. Uh, the highlight uh, to, to, to me is that the understanding of biodiversity uh, can strengthen the, the resilience of ecosystem that is essential uh, for the development and implementation of the uh, nationally appropriate preparedness and respond uh, to emergencies. And uh, we are looking forward to the progress and the experiences of the initiative and development in several countries in the Latin America, such as in Brasilia, uh, Brazil, in the work in this uh, area, uh, so that it could be example and inspiration for other countries uh, that are going to uh, make the same development. Uh, the last speaker, and not the least, is uh, Dr. Felipe Cruz Vega, uh, the Special Health Project Division of Mexican Social Security uh, Institute. Uh, Dr. Uh, Cruz Vega will be sharing his thoughts and experiences uh, of Mexico in integrating approach to health and disaster risk reduction. Uh, Dr. Cruz, please. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Eh, debo comentar que todos los programas de salud los estamos realizando por siempre bajo los criterios de, de la Oficina de Naciones Unidas para la Reducción de Riesgos de Desastre, así como de la Organización Mundial de la Salud y la Organización Panamericana de la Salud. Eh, adoptamos totalmente el marco de Sendai y los principios de Bangkok, buscando la seguridad en salud de pacientes, de su, los trabajadores de la salud y de sus familiares. Debo comentar que eh, el sólido marco jurídico con que contamos en nuestro país para estos trabajos está inscrito en la Coordinación Nacional de Protección Civil. Ahora ha tenido un nuevo impulso con el licenciado Luis Felipe Puente, que todos ustedes conocen. Y para aprovechar los cuatro minutos, quince segundos que me quedan, les eh, comentaré eh, solamente un testimonio que tiene que ver con Hospital Seguro. Eh, en este sentido, lo estoy dividiendo lo que hicimos ya antes de Sendai y lo que ya hicimos después de Sendai. Y quiero eh, comentarles que parte de, de nuestro avance se debe a que contamos con un comité nacional que se estableció desde el 2007. Este comité nacional eh, abarca todas las instituciones de salud públicas, privadas y sociales. El presidente de este Comité Nacional es el licenciado Luis Felipe Puente, por, por su cargo. Tenemos 32 entidades federativas en nuestro país y cada una de ellas tiene un comité 
de Hospital Seguro a imagen y semejanza del Nacional. Hemos puesto especial cuidado en preparar a los evaluadores de Hospital Seguro porque es un trabajo de muy alta responsabilidad. Esto lo hemos tomado en serio, el perfil de ellos, además de doctores, administradores, licenciados, enfermeras, ingenieros, eh, tienen que pasar por un proceso de, de capacitación y entrenamiento y han intentado ser evaluadores cerca de 10 mil personas con este perfil y como ven únicamente contamos con eh, 1.548 dado este proceso eh, de alta responsabilidad y esta acreditación la da, la otorga la Secretaría de Gobernación de nuestro país. En cuanto a hospitales evaluados eh, en, con este método son 934 y como ven, la mayoría de ellos cumplen eh, totalmente. Lo que nos preocupó en un momento es descubrir los 49, pero después de la preocupación mejor nos ocupamos de qué hacer con ellos. Y les quiero compartir que eh, eh, se ha invertido entre el 2007 que se creó el programa, al 2014, más de 1.800 millones de dólares, eh, aplicando para reforzar 552, cerca de 283 mil millones y en nuevos hospitales la cantidad que ustedes ven descrita en la diapositiva. Pero no es todo, esto ya el hospital seguro en mi país llegó para quedarse y quiero comentarles que ya está dispuesto un presupuesto para el del 2014 al 2018 que termina la actual administración y la cantidad de hospitales que se van a construir nuevos son 60, con un esquema especial que les vamos a compartir y para reforzarlos son 27. En este sentido, les doy solamente un ejemplo de un hospital que nosotros detectamos a través de este método que tenía una falla eh, estructural, el, el 60% del hospital estaba sobre tierra firme, pero el 40% estaba en una falla geológica muy peligrosa. ¿Qué hicimos? Lo que hicimos es demoler este hospital que ven en la diapositiva. Eh, se tard eh, y Fue un proceso importante porque daba servicio a toda una región y el separar, sacar a los pacientes, repartirlos en otras instituciones, pagar hospitales eh, privados para que lo recibieran, fue eh, un alarde de logística y se hizo una inversión de 88 millones de, de dólares para obtener el hospital que ahora ven ustedes. Eh, hay una diferencia entre siete pisos y es la estructura antigua, a un hospital moderno que además es amigable con el medio ambiente y que no tiene más de cuatro pisos. Eh, les comparto que pues, el, el 49 hospitales tuvimos que hacer prioridades, quienes necesitaban una inversión inmediata y esto lo repartimos en tres años, entre otros necesitaban escaleras de emergencia, reforzar instalaciones eléctricas, etcétera. Ahora les comparto que desde el 2007 eh, hemos construido 176 nuevos hospitales, todos ellos ya con el concepto de hospital seguro. Este es uno que está en el norte del país. Pero bueno, eso en muy breve espacio se los platicamos, pero creo que lo más importante es lo después de Sendai. Y después de Sendai, eh, inmersos en la espíritu, en la moral, la ética que nos da este marco de referencia, así como los principios de Bangkok. Nosotros eh, procedimos a incluir cuatro eh, aspectos más dentro del hospital seguro para verdaderamente poder nombrarlo resiliente. Uno tiene que ser amigable con el medio ambiente, disminuir la huella de carbono, esto lo tomamos de una iniciativa de, de la Organización Panamericana de la Salud del Caribe, que son eh, los Smart and Hearing Hospitals. Segundo, preparado para atender víctimas en masa, pero 
con el enfoque de multiamenazas para desastres producidos por la naturaleza, antrópicos y tecnológicos. Esto viene siendo con un enfoque sobre químicos biológicos, epidemiológicos, que ya se ha mencionado en esta mesa por nuestros colegas. Y, y otra situación que no podemos negar, tenemos que expandir la capacidad de forma inmediata cuando viene un desastre grande. Eh, honestamente, yo puedo hablar solamente por mi país, eh, nuestros servicios de urgencias frecuentemente están saturados. ¿Cómo vamos a hacer para recibir eh, víctimas graves en los hospitales de más alta complejidad? Y les vamos a compartir un sistema que ya tenemos funcionando. Y finalmente, si es necesario evacuar una terapia intensiva o una sala de cirugía, cuando está funcionando también tenemos ya implementado todo un protocolo. Les comparto eh, un ejemplo de cada uno de ellos. Este es un hospital que se inauguró nuestro presidente hace dos semanas, está en la costa del Pacífico, pero tiene muchas estrategias bioclimáticas, como lo ven en la diapositiva, se salva energía eléctrica, eh, agua potable, eh, gas natural, la construcción es antisísmica, como lo ven en la fotografía de arriba, y se usa, no se usaron materiales tóxicos en su construcción y se están implementando áreas eh, verdes. En la foto de abajo vemos los paneles solares que tiene en eh, toda su extensión. Un ejemplo de cómo estamos nosotros eh, implementando la atención de saldo masivo de víctimas con el enfoque eh, biológico, químico, epidemiológico, es que estamos dando un entrenamiento ya desde hace más de seis años a todos los servicios de urgencias, para que tengan los métodos de descontaminar al paciente, proteger el personal de salud y aislar dentro del hospital en sitios seguros a aquellos que pueden contaminar a otros pacientes. La expansión de la capacidad. Eh, con mucho respeto, la idea no es mía. Esta idea surgió del Coordinador Nacional de Protección Civil, que en su juventud estudió hotelería y le decían que los cuartos tenían que ser limpios, limpios, limpios. Y una tarde me dijo, doctor, que seamos honestos, nuestros servicios de, de urgencias están saturados. ¿Qué vamos a hacer cuando venga el gran terremoto? Y me propuso que él veía que algún hotel que cumpliera cierto perfil podría ser utilizado para esto. Quiero decirles que no es una idea nueva, eh, esto ya lo ha estado haciendo eh, la Oficina de Naciones Unidas para la Reducción de Desastres desde hace varios años, pero lo está haciendo con una visión eh, de turismo. Aquí nosotros investigamos y quiero decirles que en el norte de Europa, pues desde hace más de 10 años hay, hay hoteles que reciben pacientes en su preoperatorio, su posoperatorio o para convalecencia por periodos largos. Aquí en nuestro país tenemos ya en la frontera norte, de este lado del muro, eh, varios eh, hospitales que se están dedicando a esto desde hace siete años. Por lo tanto, reunimos eh, a personal experto, urgenciólogos principalmente, intensivistas, medicina interna, cirugía, ginecólogos y ya vimos que hay más de 50 diferentes diagnósticos que se pueden llevar a un hotel que tenga un perfil específico. Eh, se, tenemos el perfil del personal que los va a atender, los equipos y los materiales no son sofisticados, eh, ya tenemos el mecanismo de transferencia y todo esto se va a organizar y coordinar a través de los centros de operaciones de emergencia. Otro tema, evacuación de una terapia intensiva cuando está en funcionamiento. En mi institución con 257 hospitales tenemos conatos de incendio cada mes 2.3. Entonces, no estamos exentos de que algo pudiera surgir y ya ha surgido, entonces, reunimos intensivistas de, de muchas instituciones y ya tenemos un protocolo muy seguro, quién sale primero, con qué equipos, con qué personal, a su área de seguridad para después ser transportado a otro sitio. Esto es lo que les quiero decir y ojalá estos cinco minutos hayan llenado sus expectativas. Muchas gracias. Okay.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cruz. You have uh, five minutes time too, but uh, very interestingly, uh, thank you for sharing the experience uh, of the systematic approach that Mexico has taken in raising uh, resilience of health care system. A lot of investment has been made in the hospital strengthening, but I am sure that uh, this investment will not be beneficial only for uh, health emergency response, but also for uh, the development of health service in the long run. Um, we have come to the uh, time for um, more discussion. Uh, now, uh, before uh, the start of the open discussion, I would like to hand over to uh, my co-chair, Ms. LaRuda, to please introduce our invited discussants and invite them to make comments. Thank you, Dr. Samet. We shall now invite our discussants to give their comments on the presentations done. Each discussant, two of them, will be presenting in a matter of three-minute time. Our first discussant is Dr. Teresa Sakaria. Dr. Teresa Sakaria is an Indonesian medical doctor by profession. She represents the International Office for Migration in the Global Health Center. She also heads the Health Assistance for Crisis Affected Populations Unit based at International Office Migration's Health Division in Headquarters, Geneva. Dr. Zakaria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Laruda. Uh, good morning to afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to first thank the Global Platform for the opportunity given to me on behalf of the International Organization for Migration to highlight this important element of migration and human mobility in relation to health within the Sendai framework and the Bangkok principle, complementing the excellent elaboration of my colleagues on the panel. I would like to highlight two aspects of migration and human mobility that are equally important for disaster risk reduction. So the first one relates to the concept of inclusivity. It is indeed undisputable, next slide please. It is indeed undisputable that resilient health systems are critical for the achievement of the Sendai promise. Such health systems are only truly resilient when they are inclusive when they are inclusive and universally accessible to all individuals. Now this means beyond just citizens, to also include migrants, mobile populations, asylum seekers, refugees, and other hidden and hard to reach populations, regardless of their migration and citizenship status. Countries possessing policies that are explicitly inclusive are much more better prepared for disasters, including epidemics and pandemics. The experience of Thailand's inclusive health policies, for example, is a great reminder that a true universal health care does not require extreme wealth. Another critical feature of a resilient health system is its sensitivity to the dynamics of population mobility. Mobility is a reality of today's connected world that cannot be prevented, but rather be better managed. Access to health and continuity of care need to be framed within this reality that people move for various reasons, voluntarily or not, internally or cross-border, and therefore health systems need to be adapted to the dynamics of population mobility. The complex migration flows through the Mediterranean Sea into Europe shows the importance of multi-sectoral, cross-border, and regional collaboration for managing health, which is essential element for the implementation of the international health regulations. Therefore, proactive steps need to be taken to document evidence on population mobility to inform public health action, be it for disease prevention, 
emergency preparedness, and or within response measures. Health actions also need to be multi-sectoral and people-centered, involving the local communities and systems that are located in those areas that are very much implicated by human mobility. These can be border communities, points of entries, supervised and unsupervised, main travel routes and points of congregation. Sound understanding of mobility dynamics enables the identification of potential patterns of spread of diseases and therefore promotes better risk management in advance of health emergencies. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Ministry of Health of Congo and IOM worked together to carry out a national mobility assessment a couple of months ago. This information now serves as a reference in assessing the risk of spread of Ebola be it to other territories as well as cross borders. I would like to conclude by reiterating IOM's commitment to continue working with governments and partners in addressing this duality of migration and human mobility in health and disaster risk reduction, and this within collective efforts to build resilient health systems as well as implement the international health regulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Zakaria, for that very impressive, although brief, discourse on human mobility on migration in health and in disaster risk reduction. Our second discussant is Professor Tadanori Inomata. He is currently a strategic advisor visiting professor of Nagasaki's University Center for International Collabor Collaborative Research and a visiting professor of UNU Institute for the Advanced Study of Sustainability. He is also an author of numerous academic researches and analysis, including a report relevant for disaster response and management that is towards a United Nations Humanitarian Assistance Program for Disaster Response and Reduction, Lessons Learned from the Indian Ocean Tsunami. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Inomata, the floor is yours. Uh, it seems that I'm addressing uh, already forgotten or neglected crisis. Uh, I must uh, emphasize that the ISDL has a clear mandate to address nuclear and radiological disasters. Sendai framework enlarged the scope of ISDR to cover nuclear disaster. Then the Bangkok, uh, the uh, principles, also decided to develop a you know, multi-hazard approach to disaster. So radiation is also uh, the subject to be taken up. Then uh, open-ended intergovernmental expert work, working group on indicators decided to collect the data on nuclear hazards. So there must be no doubt about the competence of ISDL to address nuclear and radio, radiological, radio, radiological disasters. I must just uh, say that, you know, the uh, nuclear disaster has the uh, three you know, the characteristics of the disasters. That is large scale, slow onset, onset, and sudden onset. But the, according to my colleagues, we might say that, you know, these are the disasters, you know, with acute and chronic and direct and indirect impact and damage, which require intensive evidence-based science policy interface to implement a national multi-hazard risk, uh, risk management plan. So, so it will be late to put you know, the, uh, something uh, uh, the substantive uh, the, uh, part, of the, uh, part, part of the presentation. I must say that the, right after the uh, great earthquake and the Fukushima, uh, the nuclear plant disaster, there were nearly half a million evacuees. Now it, it, it decreased to just 100,000. Uh, but the bulk of the evacuees concentrated in Fukushima. 
the there's a question of or the uh, question question the other is social uh, psychological stress and all the people who are uh, displaced have no elements to decide whether to return or where to return. So, and about 20,000 evacuees, uh, evacuees are under 18 years old. Uh, obesity of the population is in remarkable increase. The family bondage often risks being broken and solitary deaths of elderly and aged persons are frequent. Still, uh, still unfounded rumors on Fukushima food products as well as discriminatory attitude against Fukushima persist. Sustainable development opportunity, employment opportunities are lacking with the declined industrial and agricultural output by some 20%. So population of Fukushima has decreased from a little over 2 million to 1.8 million. So state of the Fukushima people affected by the nuclear radiological disaster looms large as a major public health issue in Japan. Risk of radiation health consequences for the uh, Fukushima people may be considered to be very low comparison to what the uh, uh, children will experience. But the long-term impacts are still, still unknown. Identification of cause and disease relationship is very difficult to prove, as well as those res responsive relationship. A large number of people have received psychological, mental care, aggravated by radiation fear and anxiety, I'm sorry, <laughs> my computer is, uh, and they remain in, in a very uncertain situation, having been evacuated several times, as, but not yet relocated. This situation is shared through, throughout the uh, general population. We have looked into, more carefully into the community level. Uh, Kaochi village, the first local community achieving return of almost all inhabitants and recovery from nuclear and related hazards. And evacuation provides the following lessons. The continued comprehensive health checkup of all individuals is indispensable for evaluating those, those responsive relationships and achieving resilience and the countermeasure against public fear and anxiety about radiation. There shall be a paradigm shift from radiation safety principle based on radioactive doses to the tackling with societal factors that are determinant of public health. Public health, not only of evacuees, but also general population is very much affected by social, environmental, and psychological impacts of both of the nuclear accident and countermeasures evacuation, relocation, decontamination, constraints on freedom of residence and movement, as well as ecosystem use for livelihood. Comprehensive risk management is required during crisis and post-crisis period. After the nuclear power plant accident, there the reliability of and credibility of crisis communication is of high priority together with post-crisis this communication with the affected population to address directly, face-to-face, -face, 
the concerns of inhabitants. There is a pressing need for establishing an international recovery platform on natural di nuclear disaster under the aegis of ISDR to promote best practices and professional capacity building and education in nuclear disaster risk management, reduction and recovery that are conducive to risk communication with affected population and other stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Inomata, for that rather technical commentary. Yeah, we have to move on, even though now we have been uh, quite uh, uh, behind the time. Uh, we, we need some good news. <laughs> and uh, disaster risk reduction is the task beyond a national boundary. It is a global task. And international uh, cooperation and support is very essential. Uh, there, there are now more and more uh, examples of uh, international partners coming to support the implementation of the health aspects of uh, Sendai. Uh, I would like to uh, call upon uh, one representative of such uh, partner, uh, Dr. Timothy Bully of the World Bank. Uh, can, can you please uh, come up on stage and uh, make uh, a brief but very meaningful intervention of commitment? making sure everyone's still awake. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. So the World Bank recognizes the critical linkages between sustainable development, health, and disaster risk reduction. We have to date and will continue to work with partners, such as those on stage, to reduce the negative health impacts associated with disasters, ready the health sector for disaster preparedness, recovery, and response in the context of building universal health coverage, and work to better understand the associations between environmental change, including climate change, disasters, and health. We'll do this in three areas. First, we will continue to contribute to this important intersection by knowledge building. In recent years, we have produced reports and analytics on antimicrobial resistance, climate-sensitive disease risks, pandemics, One Health, and have established a health sector approach for this new era of climate risk, climate-smart healthcare. Each of these issues have clear association with the disaster risk reduction, and we look forward to applying these uncovered approaches in World Bank operations and lending, and are eager to continue to share these lessons with our partners. Second, we will continue to establish frameworks and financing mechanisms that protect health in the face of disasters, disease risks, and climate change. Recently, and with partners including the World Health Organization, have developed a pandemic emergency financing facility to prevent rare, high-severity disease outbreaks from becoming more deadly and costly pandemics. We are working with the government of Japan on the new World Bank Japan Universal Health Coverage Initiative aimed toward accelerating UHC implementation and improving pandemic preparedness in 35 initial countries. And we have established an operational framework for health at the animal-human environment interface that uh, directly addresses the need for targeted investments to prevent, prepare, detect, respond to, and recover from disease-related threats. Third, we will continue to establish tools that link disaster risk reduction, climate change, and health, and have built an online recovery hub to serve as a one-stop shop for disaster recovery operations by sector, including health. We have prepared guidance for local and central government health sector officials for immediate, short-term, medium, and long-term recovery, and have established a robust methodology for screening all World Bank investments for climate and disaster risk. We very much appreciate the opportunity to be included in this discourse and look forward to working together with a broader community of the United Nations, civil society, donors, researchers, and government. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bully, for your very brief but very crisp and clear message. Thank you very much, World Bank, uh, for your commitment on in, uh, in support 
uh, of the implementation of this uh, framework. Uh, and this sets a very good example for similar and different contributions from other partners that are essential for raising uh, the capacity of countries in disaster risk management, especially developing countries. Uh, even though we have uh, put our stomach on hold uh, for some time beyond uh, lunchtime, I hope that we still have uh, some moment to welcome questions and comments from the floor. Uh, we expect a few uh, questions and comments before response uh, from the panelists. Uh, yes, please. Yes, uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Francois Gruneval. I'm from a French Research and Evaluation Center. I would like to bring four very practical issues that we have seen in the field and which are not emerging uh, very strongly, and I think they are, they are very important. Um, the first one is acute disasters have different types of impact on health. Uh, it all depends, for example, on the type of buildings. In BAM earthquake, most people die by suffocation, while in AT earthquake, most people were wounded by um, cement. And uh, sometimes we have uh, too much of a standardized approach and not taking into account that diversity of uh, health impact of disasters. Tsunami, nobody, I mean, most people were killed by the wave and very few bruised. And, uh, we had an immense deployment of health teams which remained absolutely un unuseful uh, for, for, for the first three weeks, and I was there for evaluation. That first point, so how do we tune much better the preparedness of the health response with the type of disaster? That's point one. The second point, uh, I mentioned that uh, the other day, but the first responders in health, especially those who are uh, doing the triage, they are under an incredible pressure and they are themselves suffering because of their own work and there is very little support to them and I think this is an area where supporting the first uh, responder in the health sector who are often exposed to horrible things is, is very much lacking and one of the third element which I think is often uh, a weak part in the process is what I would call uh, proper and respectful dead body management. And we, we do a lot of work on forensic. We, we have, uh, especially we have seen that, you have seen that doctor in, after the tsunami in, in, in Thailand. Uh, a lot of effort is done for, because you have foreigner people killed, <coughs> but for local people who have been killed themselves, there is less effort to have more respectful dead body management. And I think this is an area where we should um, do some effort. My conclusion remark, I was involved in the evaluation after the earthquake in Nepal of disaster preparedness programs that were done before the earthquake. And our observation is, indeed, it works extremely well. Trained staff, uh, people knowing what to do in the hospital, uh, hospitals which have been made resilient and, and, uh, and more resistant to shocks, it works extremely well. Thank you. And, and one in the back, uh, yes. So my name is Shireen Zaim, and I'm representing the International Federation of Medical Students, uh, part of the UN Major Group for Children. Review of the role of health in DR. Uh, the International Federation of Medical Students Association and its 132 member and organizations are actively involved in disaster and emergency medicine, advocating for better access to humanitarian aid and building capacity for gra uh, greater prevention, preparedness, and response um, amongst medical students. So the evidence shows that doctors uh, expected to participate and act in the cases of disasters and large scale uh, emergencies don't feel sufficiently prepared and trained 
especially in the case of biohazard and nuclear disasters. And our experience as IFMSA is that very few institutions educate their students on these topics and therefore have put in place our own capacity building program on DR. So my questions to the panelists would be, what solutions would you propose to further integrate DRR and resilience education in health practitioners' curriculum? And also we spoke of inclusiveness on the panel. As a follow-up question, I would also ask what we can, uh, we as the health and DRR community can do better to actively integrate youth not only in the medical students that we represent, but also students and young professionals that are uh, in all disciplines in decision making related to emergency reduction, preparedness, and response. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, the gentleman in, yeah. in the front and next to yours. Okay. Uh, my name is Dr. Kailas Gupta. I'm from the International Emergency Management Society, and uh, the gentleman raised the question of the mass fatalities management of the dead bodies. So for, from uh, after tsunami to, uh, uh, in India and Bang uh, Sri Lanka, after cyclone Naila, Bangladesh, uh, India, after Haiti uh, and Nepal, I have been doing mass fatalities management research funded by National Science Foundation, and uh, my dissertation in after Haiti, and uh, my question is, it has been found after Haiti and in Nepal and other places that so many search and rescue teams, I, I'm, I don't have numbers now, go, but they are hardly able to recover very few dead bodies. And uh, so much money and, uh, and also in the uh, um, dead bodies are rescue. It is the only local people who do. So whether for the international body, the money, effort, and all the international teams, they go there, and they, is it worthwhile economically, which is a serious case. Uh, you know, local people, they are more able to help. So this is my uh, question about consideration, and I, I'm not able to give statistics, but it is very serious problem. And my research has been on recovering body, uh, preserving identification and disposition. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, we're on the back side here. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let, let me take uh, one from the lady in the front first, yes. and, and then you. next to you. Yeah. Congratulations to the panel for their erudite contributions. I, at the United Nations, represent the International Association of Applied Psychology and the Psychology Coalition of NGOs accredited at the UN, and I'm a professor of psychology at Columbia, at the Teachers College. And I've done a lot of work in psychosocial support all over the world after disasters in China, in Japan, in Nepal, um, and with Ebola, during Ebola, uh, in Sierra Leone. I have heard a mention uh, today about the word psychological. And of course, the Sendai framework has paragraph 33-0 about psychosocial support. And there is mental health and uh, well-being in the Sustainable Development Goals in 3.4 Target. So I would like to ask the panel and the collection of peoples here, uh, what can be done to further integrate the psychosocial support within the framework of health that we're talking about here? Because after all, this is about the people. Resilience is a word used here. It's very important to think about psychosocial resilience as, as just not just structural resilience. People, research shows, are suffering tremendously from the after effects of all these disasters, both epidemics and natural disasters. And in order to prevent this, we need to help people build their psychosocial resilience. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Okay, can you and Ed's talk? Uh, yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to give my voice to one of the social groups that seems to be quite really voiceless during the debate today. It's concerning the HIV dimension in the DDR process. And I'm sure that, I mean, you would all recall that conflict and disasters always contribute to the spread of HIV. Unless we're trying to quite really tackle those who are most vulnerable 
during, you know, the disaster process. And I'm talking about women, children, often, and more importantly, the group called LGBT, and not neglecting people living with HIV. And therefore, perhaps there is one figure here that I would like to quote, which is extremely important. As of today, we have two million of people living with HIV affected by emergency and disaster. And out of that figure, we've got something like more than 200,000 children. This is a serious and a very important aspect that needs to be quietly tackled. Unless we're trying to address that need, those who are most vulnerable, giving the voice to those who do not have a voice, we will not be able to achieve the zero discrimination, zero HIV death, and more importantly, making sure that this, uh, the sustainable development goal will be quite really fully achieved. Thank you. Uh, thank you Please. very much. Um, um, probably I, I will uh, open for one more yep, yes, comments, it's please. Me. Thank um, you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, two more. Okay. And, and then we need to close. Uh, uh, gentlemen in, in the front, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I will go straight to the point. And, uh, you know, a lot of times when there's a national disaster, and um, we, we, we see people who are hurt, and it's very obvious, very visible. That's where most of the medical attention goes. But I would like to highlight the situation of non-communicable diseases, things which are hidden, which are not seen, uh, especially mental health, uh, pe people dealing, not receiving counseling, people not dealing with trauma or grief. There is already evidence of high incidence of disaster-related deaths that happen post a disaster. And I don't know whether there is any focus by the international community in dealing with that. There's a huge gap in that area. So my question to the panel is, are we considering all these things also? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And the last comment, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Safrizal. I come from Indonesia. Um, as we know that uh, Indonesia, one is of the biggest disaster laboratories in the world. As you know, on 2016, we have about 2,352 disasters was happened in Indonesia, including flood, landslip, typhoon, earthquake, volcano eruptions, and others. Since 2004, where big earthquake and Hindia ocean tsunami, we try to increase our capacity in disaster by some actions, such as like uh, put the disaster management as a part of the curriculum in medical faculty in Indonesia. And we also put the hospital disaster plan as a part of accreditations for the hospital. We prepare emergency medical team for every hospital in Indonesia. And also our government point of April 26 as a national day of disaster preparedness. We campaign disaster resilient school, disaster resilient village, and safe community in whole of Indonesia. I am the one who's come from Aceh, the place where tsunami was happened. After the tsunami, we have a new hospital and we believe our hospital is a very strong hospital. And they said it will be strong even the earthquake until nine Richter scales. We prefer every year for the disaster preparedness. But in 2012, the real earth, earthquakes happened in our hospital. It was 8.5 Richter scales. You know what happened? We don't realize that if the earthquake coming, the officer, the nurse, the every staff in hospital will disappear from the hospital. We know that the hospital is the safest place, but we forgot that all of the officials, of the, the staff in the hospital is human. They have their own family. They have to save their own family. So this is the experience that changes everything. Since now, we believe that we also can think things about the condition of our staff who's working in hospital to make them feel safety to working even in disaster. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I would like to have uh, one more uh, bonus, one before la after last. Yes. Good afternoon, and thank you very much. Um, my name is Apsara from uh, Nepal. I am nurse. I am here from my organization, Nepal Nursing Association. Yeah. I just want to share the experience from Nepal earthquake 2015. Mill millions of people are displaced after the earthquake. Till date, they are living in temporary shelter, commonly. All vulnerable groups, including pregnant women and lactating mother, are living there commonly. There is no food, scarcity of food, purified water, problem of water, sanitation, hygiene, all things are there. So in this condition, how we can assure the good and optimum health? Health is multi-dimensional thing, not a single thing. In this condition, getting optimum health is very challenging. So we use it, we used the local community nurses who work in actually in their community, who lived in actually in their own community, we mobilize them and we mobilize them, they went to the shelter who uh, displaced people live in those shelter, our nurses went to the shelter and monitor monitor the health status. Not only the disease condition, overall living environment, water, food, sanitation, hygiene. There is a lots of psychosocial problem, there is a lots of uh, malnutrition and other uh, infectious disease. In, the, in our health care system, there is a surveillance system, but only the cases affected person who visited in uh, healthcare system, our health um, surveillance system only notified that cases. But many persons living in center could not go to the healthcare system. There is a lot of problem. So in this condition, our nurses, local nurses, EP nurse, provide the healthcare service, not only the healthcare service, they provide the health education, they coordinate with existing health care uh, services, health care system, even with the international community, and uh, provide the all uh, basic needs things, and uh, provides shelter management. And our nurses also uh, transfer the data in our existing health care surveillance system in center, through the use of technology, um, at least mobile phone. In remote area, they cannot use uh, the, even a smartphone because there is a no electricity, there, there is a uh, internet connectivity problem, even there is, uh, if there is uh, electricity. But nurses can use mobile. So we develop one uh, system and uh, our nurses used that system and transferred the data in main system. So we feel this uh, experience is very successful and very cost effective also. So we from Nepal experience, I would like to recommend to the panelists how we incorporate this experience, how we incorporate uh, um, our concept of EP nurse, local level community nurses to provide the health services and ensure the um, safe and good optimum health and 
prevention of disease, communicable disease outbreak. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all your very, very good comments and sharing of, of experiences. Even some, some of them might appear like questions, but in the final, they all are the a very good sharing of experiences, uh, highlights, advice. These are very, very useful uh, message uh, for all of us uh, to take home and to move forward. I, uh, in the interest of time, I think that it is not possible for us to res respond uh, for each uh, comment or question, but I would like to consult with my co-chair to move forward into the semi-final part of the uh, session by asking our uh, panelists, each of them, to provide a one-minute final comment that may be to highlight or summarize uh, uh, your message or to respond to some of the comments or questions from the floor. Is it okay? If so, I would like to turn over to, to you, the co-chair. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sam. We now ask our panelists for their closing reflections. You're given one minute each. So we start with Dr. Alex Camacho. The floor is yours, Dr. Camacho. Okay. Eh, gracias. Eh, estoy muy contento de haber escuchado las reflexiones, los comentarios, las preguntas del, del público. Eh, para las Américas, y creo para los ministerios de salud, estoy convencido, será muy, muy grato escuchar que lo que ustedes han mencionado se está reflejando en las acciones que se están desarrollando. Empiezo por el caso de por la pregunta de Nepal, rápidamente voy a demorar menos de un minuto. Eh, una forma práctica en la que se está haciendo eso es incluyendo a todo el equipo de salud en el entrenamiento de comando de incidentes en hospitales. Un ejemplo próximo que incluso usted lo puede compartir, el Director Nacional de Discapacidades de, de, de Emergencias y Desastres del Ministerio de Salud y que dio resultado en el terremoto de Ecuador. Gracias a eso continuaron operando los servicios y las enfermeras, como todos los profesionales, han sido parte de eso. Relacionado y tomando como este punto también el rol importante que pueden cumplir los voluntarios de salud, los estudiantes de medicina, eh, esto está incorporado dentro del componente del conocimiento del riesgo, de la primera línea de acción, no solamente conocer el riesgo, evidencia, sino también cómo se incluye en los programas de entrenamiento, no solamente en el posgrado, que ya se lo está desarrollando en varios países. El tema del posgrado es un tema fundamental, el terremoto del Ecuador lo demostró, miles de estudiantes y de médicos queriendo ayudar, pero no sabían cómo, es una brecha que tenemos que llenar, sin duda alguna. En el tema del soporte psicosocial, eh, la estrategia que se está desarrollando es el entrenamiento de los equipos de pronta respuesta en salud mental, son varios de los entrenamientos que se está desarrollando, hay una iniciativa en progreso y de hecho también aplicada en los últimos desastres como eh, en Perú y de igual manera en, en Ecuador. En el tema de AIDS y de la, del respeto básicamente a los aspectos de, de género, es un tema transversal en el Plan de Acción de Reducción de Riesgo de Desastres para las Américas, así como lo es el tema de discapacidad y de etnicidad, dos aspectos muchas veces invisibles, con muy buenas voluntades, pero con pocas acciones, pero ya aspectos se están desarrollando. Y el tema de enfermedades no transmisibles, perdón que me haya tomado un poco más del tiempo, pero en nuestros hospitales están muriendo en las salas de emergencia más gente que en los mismos desastres, personas con diabetes, personas con hipertensión, con sus complicaciones, generando una sobrecarga a los servicios de emergencia y es por eso justamente que había mencionado la necesidad de incorporar a los sistemas médicos de emergencia en todo el proceso de la gestión del riesgo de desastres. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Dr. Camacho. We now move to Dr. Schiotti. Your reflections, please. Thank you. Well, my reflections are uh, related to uh, an aspect that we have been uh, uh, discussing very much in, 
in, in Europe, but also globally in, in the area of uh, public health. And um, we know that we have uh, plans, that are, uh, disaster preparedness plans, or uh, in communicable disease preparedness plans, public health emergency preparedness plans. Uh, how do we know if they work? So there are two ways. Either you have a disaster or you have an outbreak, then you see if uh, your plan works. And the second is uh, to uh, test it or to evaluate um, uh, in, a, in a, so to simulate a disaster, not to simulate an outbreak. Um, there are other methods that to, uh, to, to try to understand whether a system is ready uh, to respond. Um, the, there are ma methods and, um, and ways to do that. But uh, what we often see is that what emanates from the, um, what we call the lessons learned exercises uh, is uh, poorly implemented into the, the plans. So they, they, they are, we are learning more and more that we haven't learned from uh, past uh, outbreaks and disasters. Uh, and that is not because the scientific community is is wrong. It's because there's, um, I, I am part of a scientific community, and um, uh, we always say that uh, the politicians don't understand us. Uh, um, and I am much more now uh, prone to say that we don't understand the politicians. <clears throat> we need to understand how our evidence is transferred into uh, policy decisions. <clears throat> the interests are different from uh, from ours, and that is what we have to learn. So that's my message. Thank you, Dr. Shotty. Our next doctor to give the reflections would be Dr. Felipe Cruz Vega, and we hope that Dr. Karish would be very obliging on this. Dr. Vega would be leaving very soon. So your Dr. Vega, please. Eh, muchas gracias eh, eh, por, por este privilegio. Eh, la, la verdad, me ha dado mucho gusto estar en este evento y quiero eh, felicitar a los excelentes panelistas, pero sobre todo las aportaciones que han hecho en las intervenciones de nuestro público aquí presente. Eh, tengan confianza que el marco de Sendai va a abarcar lo que ustedes están manifestando. También el, eh, se está reforzando con los elementos que ya se presentaron de Bangkok. Por favor, tengan la confianza que todo esto se está trabajando y que el hacer este tipo de eventos nos permite precisamente tener una comunicación horizontal y poder tomarnos de la mano porque estamos juntos para reducir la, el riesgo de desastres. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Dr. Cruz Vega. So, we now give the floor to Dr. William Karish for his closing reflections. Thank you, Madam Chair. I only have two requests from you, all of you in the audience. Um, one is to, to maybe possibly engage your colleagues and, and think about a shift in your thinking about that disasters and the relationship with disease or health is not just a sad, unfortunate consequence of other disasters, it is, but that we are now seeing that big disease outbreaks, epidemics, pandemics, or disasters of, in and of themselves. And so we need to start thinking about risk reduction there and engaging more people to help us there. My second point um, is that I don't hear enough about prevention, and I work on the upstream side in prevention. And preparedness and response are, of course, essential, but we see a lot of money mobilized towards response, and it's very difficult to get funding for prevention. And I think these epidemics and outbreaks and pandemics some of them are actually preventable. And so think about ways that we can engage other sectors and our other partners in prevention, even if we can reduce them by 10% or 20%, we'll have an amazing beneficial impact on the health of people and the health of the planet. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karish. And now, last but not certainly not the least, the lady to my left, the beautiful lady to my left, has the floor, Ms. Christina Romanelli. Thank you very much. The, uh, as, as somebody has noted, the advantage of going last is that most of the wonderful points that needed to be made have already been made, not the least of which was the note on, on prevention. Um, which was actually going to be my, my, my closing remark, really the need to focus on preventive rather than uh, reactive approaches to risk management. But maybe more broadly still is that while the challenges that we face truly are great, and we're not here to try to minimize um, the importance of those challenges, the opportunities that we have before us to prevent and respond to these challenges are equally great. But to do so, we do have to consider notions such as inclusivity, as was raised by one of our previous speakers, the need to build capacity, the need for education, to embed these things in our education systems from the very start. So not just cross, it's not just about cross-sectoriality, but also multidisciplinarity as we train our doctors, as we train our medical professionals, and, and as we train the conservation community uh, who need to work together. Um, and maybe on a final note, just reiterating that together with other holistic approaches, ecosystem approaches such as One Health are very much aligned with the Bangkok pr principles and really do offer critical opportunities to build back better and offer whole of society solutions, making social and econo ecological systems more resilient and by incorporating opportunities provided by nature and ecosystems to reduce disaster risk. So each one of us here today has a critically important role to play to build these more resilient systems. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Christina. And now, it seems we have overshot our time slot. And so, I turn over the floor to my co-chair, Dr. Summit. Uh, thank you, Dr. Larura. Now it's time for a real conclusion. Um, I want to summarize a number of key messages that we have shared in this session uh, with the participation of representatives from the government, stakeholders, including those from international organizations and civil society. Uh, please uh, bear with me for a few minutes because these are very important. Uh, first, in view of the impact of disasters, biohazards, including pandemic and epidemic of even endemic diseases, as Dr. Koresh uh, pointed out, they warrant inclusive action under Sendai framework. Two, the Bangkok principles for the implementation of health aspects of the Sendai framework offer key actions to be taken by countries and partners to optimize prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery from health emergencies. These national capacities require whole of society participation to integrate risk-informed planning into health sector and promote health system resilience. Three, we have learned that more and more countries are taking this agenda forward, as excellent examples from various countries have been shared in this forum. Four, countries and agencies are urged to move further into integrating the Bangkok principles in their national and local plans for disaster risk reduction towards the achievements of Sendai framework and simultaneously for the achievements of other related global commitments. 
5, the human-animal ecosystem interface, as well as changes in land use, climate, human settlement, and trade and travel are very important. These factors must be taken into the disaster risk reduction planning at the national and local levels. Six, the disaster risk reduction plans should also ensure the integration of the vulnerable population, such as migrants, refugees, women, children, people with disabilities and the, and the elderly, and should ensure attention on community empowerment, adaptive governance and management, and ecosystem-based approaches. Seven, we value synergies among related frameworks. Health system strengthening for disaster risk reduction also reinforces the sustainable development goals, the Paris Agreement, the new urban agenda, the biodiversity and health initiatives, the international health regulations, and as well as uh, other frame frameworks and mechanisms related to health emergencies and risk management. And finally, we all commit to communicate these key messages to our governments, institutions, and communities to minimize the threats of health disasters. I will end my uh, message now. I would like to hand over to the co-chair if you will make a final uh, comment, uh, Dr. Larula. Thank you, Dr. Summit. It would seem that from the vulnerable group, the older persons, our call would be for inclusivity because we know that health is inclusive, so nobody, no one must be left behind. Thank you. So, uh, with the agreement of all of us, may I call this session to a close. And after that, I would like to uh, hand over to Dr. Chadia if you would like to make a, 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 another announcement. Uh, just uh, to thank uh, the co-chairs and the uh, speakers uh, for the very valuable and informative presentations. And also uh, thanks the audience and the participants for their inputs and for staying uh, behind time. And one uh, just last request uh, to iterate that we have to spread the message widely and communicate these key messages that Dr. Submit uh, uh, beautifully summarized the session with. Uh, to our communities uh, and to our stakeholders and uh, to our uh, uh, government officials and uh, to, to join more forces to advance the integration of health into disaster risk reduction and vice versa. Thank you so much and I look forward to continue working with you. Thanks. Thank you and bon appetit.